7 ways to improve your indie game in half the amount of time. That's a really compelling title, let's give it a watch and I'll share my thoughts. By the way, if you follow my Game Dev Report newsletter, you might have already seen this. In there, I normally include a section for interesting videos that I saw, so if you want to stay up to date with the news, or hear about some interesting articles that I find, then check the link in the description and sign up. And for context, CJ has just launched his game, Castles on Clouds. It's a very interesting roguelike tower defense. So let's see some seven tips that you learned in the past six months. Here are seven ways to make your indie game better and get it done in half the amount of time. And I guarantee you will take away at least one thing from this video that will save you months of wasted time. My name's TJ. I spent the past six months developing Castles on Clouds. And right away, I want to say I love that. I love the six month time frame for making a game. I'm always a huge fan of making smaller games. Six months is enough time to build something really nice, but not too much time that you spend way too much on your game. Personally, I'm a huge fan of making small games. I think that especially in the beginning when you're just getting started when you're trying to learn a lot, I really think at most you should spend three to six months on a game. You should really only spend over one year on a game when you already have quite a bit of experience. And like we can see here in six months, you can definitely build something really awesome. It was on clouds. My goal was to get it on Steam and I did. I'm going to go over the most important things that I learned so that you can get the lessons without the scars. Now, the first of which, and what I think is the most important point is to set deadlines. Knowing that I only had six months to complete this game, I told a lot of people that I was going to get it done in six months. It kept me honest and it kept me rolling out of bed. Even some mornings that I was really tired, I knew that I still had to keep working on the game and keep progressing. Deadlines are a really interesting thing. It can really help you, force you in order to make sure that you are actually making progress and actually going towards some kind of finish line. Whereas if you don't have a deadline, you might just keep working it endlessly because there's really no end in sight. And what you mentioned there about talking to other people, that is something that for some people also helps quite a lot. Basically, if you tell other people about your goal, then you're kind of committing, you really have to do it. Usually people don't like to disappoint others. So if you tell someone else, okay, I'm working on this game, it will be done in six months then those people are probably going to ask you in six months, okay, where's the game? So that can be an interesting strategy if you have trouble with motivation. If you have someone else that knows about your plan and your plan has a specific deadline, that can definitely help you be much more motivated to actually achieve that deadline. Now, because I knew I had such a tight deadline when I was originally scoping out the game, what features I wanted to add had to be prioritized by what I could get done in that time. So that is another excellent one. I mean, one of the biggest issues with indie game development is always scope management. Whenever you're designing a game, it's really human nature to want to keep expanding upon it. As you build your game, as you build some game design, you always think, oh, this would be another cool idea to add another cool mechanic. And then you just keep adding and adding and adding. And after a while, you really have like a five-year development plan. So by having a deadline, that also really forces you to think about that. You might think, okay, this would be a really cool idea, but adding this is really going to push me way past the deadline. So let's keep that idea in mind. You definitely don't have to completely ignore it. Just write it down in a piece of paper. And later on, when you have more time, then come back to it. But yeah, as always, when making games, always keep in track of your scope. If you don't, then that scope is really just going to run away and you're never going to actually finish the game. Maybe there was something I really wanted to add, but I knew it was going to take months of development time. I had to cut that idea and focus more on what I knew I could get done. I also intentionally left the final sixth month completely empty so I could use it for doing things like balancing and polishing the game. That wound up being 100% needed. That is another really awesome thing. It's really awesome for two specific reasons. Number one, there are always problems at the end that you never anticipate. So if you decide yourself a six month time frame to build a game, it is definitely very wise to actually build the game in just five months because you know you're going to have to fix quite a lot of things in that last month. And also the second reason why that is an excellent tip is because really one of the main things that I always say is how what separates a good game from a great game is polish. You can take something that is pretty decent, and if you spend a little bit of time just polishing it, setting all kinds of sound effects, particle effects, lights, and so on, if you spend some time just focusing on that, just focusing on polish, so not building new things, just taking what you have and making it really awesome, if you spend that, it actually helps a lot more than just having a bunch more mechanics. That is something you have probably learned yourself if you've done a lot of game jams. You can only see how the games that end up at the top of the game jam, they are not the games with the most mechanics, but rather they have a fixed scope, and then they simply just polish the hell out of that scope. So do not neglect polish. Polish is a really important thing. So this is really an excellent tip. Figure out your time frame, then shorten it a bit and make sure the end is reserved for bug fixes and a ton of polish. Estimating the amount of development time it takes to do something isn't going to be an exact science. So I continually went back every single day, every single week and reorganized my roadmap as to what I wanted to get done at what time. I'm gonna link my roadmap down below so you can see day by day, week by week, month by month, how I was structuring and organizing the project. This is another really interesting thing. When it comes to project management, there are really a million ways to do it. There are no right or wrong answers. 
And this is actually a really interesting one, basically keeping track, keeping a log of all the things that you build throughout the months. For me, I normally have a very high level overview of the game design or the to-do list. And every single day, I add more specific things to that to-do list, and then just go do those tasks one by one, constantly taking them. And as I run out of tasks, I go again, I analyze what is missing, then I add some more and keep doing it. So yeah, this is another great way to keep you focused. Keep a nice to-do list so you know exactly what you need to do and how far along the end line is from it. By the way, I feel like a deadline of uh, six months was a little too long. After month four or five, I wanted to restart the project and apply everything that I had learned in the first few months. Okay, this is a really interesting thing. It's very common for people to feel this way. Basically, build a project and if you're focused on actually learning, and if you make a project over several months, then yeah, after a little bit, you feel, okay, I'm so much better. I really want to redo this from scratch, but my advice is do not do this. Whatever project you have, definitely take the completion. Yes, you could definitely remake it from scratch and remake those four months and probably end up doing it in just one month or two months. And it would probably be quite a lot better. But if you do that, then you never end up reaching the end. You never end up releasing any game. So it's a really awesome thing that you're building on something and you're learning, but definitely do take it to the finish line. Don't just constantly restart projects over and over again. If you do, that really will not help. Always remember, there's always going to be another game in the future. So whatever you learned, keep working on this game, keep taking it to the finish line, and then for the next game, you can make that one a lot better. And I'm very happy I didn't. As I said earlier, some things like balancing and localization wound up taking way longer than I expected. And if I had just restarted the project like I had done with so many projects in the past, I never would have understood how long those things are going to take. But now that I know, going forward, I can more accurately scope for the next game. The entire point of doing this video though is so that you can learn from my mistakes without having the scars from doing them yourself. I think the saying is, a wise man learns from his mistakes, an even wiser man learns from the mistakes of others. And now, let's talk about scope for a second. Because I had such strict deadlines, scope creep wasn't an issue for me, but my problem was that my initial scope was wildly unrealistic. <laughs> yeah, that's really a common problem. Like I was saying a while ago, you have to manage scope, but also at the very beginning of the project, when defining things, you have to keep track of what scope it is, what exactly is the size of the game that you're trying to build. So the joke that a lot of people like to say is, come up with your game idea, come up with your game scope, then cut it in half, cut it in half again, and you might have something that is actually doable within that time frame. That sounds like a joke, but in many cases, that is actually very correct. Whatever game idea you have, chances are it's going to take much, much longer than you think. This was what I originally wrote down as a tag for the game. Okay, yeah, so right away, that is quite a lot of things. Not just quite a lot of different genres, but actually very complex genres. I mean, making strategy games is quite a bit more complex than making something like a platformer. Tower Defense Simulation, Roguelike, City Builder, all of these are very complex genres. So yeah, putting together five different genres, all of them very complex, yeah, that's definitely going to be quite tricky, especially for a three to six month project. This is way too much. What happens when you're trying to do genre mashups of like six different genres is that each one winds up coming out half-baked. What would have been better is if I had focused all my time on making one to two genres and perfecting them, five Michelin stars, I think the end result of the game would have been way better. That is also a very interesting point. Again, like I was saying ago, it is much better to have a game with fewer mechanics, but all of those really solid. They really work well together with one another, as opposed to have something with a massive amount of mechanics, but they're all very half-baked. They don't really interact with one another. So when in doubt, go for a design that is quite a bit smaller, quite a bit tighter, but everything works very well together. So moving on to game design. This wound up being a huge weakness for me. Think for a second, what's your current favorite game? and what makes it so fun. Now, the first thing that came to mind probably wasn't the flashy graphics or super polished code architecture or its perfect performance. Although those things are all still important and necessary and they should be in every single game, there's something else that makes the core gameplay loop fun. This is also another very interesting point that quite a lot of people don't realize, which is how game design is an actual discipline by itself. Personally, for me, I would definitely say it is partly one of my weaknesses. I love programming, I love writing code. So because of that, I love making systems and I love making games. But writing programming is not necessarily the same thing as being good at game design. That is a different skill, it's a different muscle, it's something else that you have to train. There is quite a lot of difference between a game that is really just functional and one that has some proper game design. Some of the best examples when it comes to just straight up game design are games like FTL and Into the Breach. Really excellent games which, again, have a relatively tight scope, so not too many mechanics but all of them work very well together with one another. That is really the excellence of game design. And again, that is really a skill. So as you're improving your programming, your drawing, your 3D modeling skills, also make sure you also improve your game design skills. Now, what can I do to learn what makes my favorite game fun? 
other than actually going out and playing or watching people play these games. So in order to solve these game design questions, I started taking a few minutes each day to look at other games and expose myself to what players are expecting. And on game design, yes, another thing to keep in mind, if you are a game dev, then you can definitely play games for research. A lot of people say that as a joke, but that can be an actual thing. Just make sure you're actually playing the game, actually researching, trying to understand why does this mechanic work? Why do these enemies behave this way? Why does this combination of enemies work better than this one? So definitely do play games for research, but definitely make sure you are actually doing research and not just actually playing for fun. Because if I don't know what players are expecting, I'm never going to hit those expectations. You really need to feed your creativity. Coding 12 hours a day is worthless if you're not coding something fun. Playing an hour of 20 minutes till dawn gave me the idea to add impactful trade-offs on relics and cards. Then, after watching one hour of Wanderbot's playthrough of Thronefall's new roguelike mode, I saw how the layout reset every few nights. This gave me the idea of regenning the island each season, but carrying over the player's cards and relics. This resetting progression each season literally improved the game 100 times. Yep, whenever you have doubts on where to push your game next, playing similar related games and getting ideas from those mechanics that can help quite a ton. But again, do make sure you're analyzing the game, you're analyzing why does this work, don't just look at a related game that has some kind of mechanic and just copy paste that mechanic. If you do, chances are it won't work. But if you realize why does this mechanic work and you figure out some way to apply it unique to your game, if you do that, then you're probably going to find success. Now, next, I want to talk about the gameplay loop. This wound up being a bit of a sore point for me as sometimes I'd have to play the game for 20 minutes just to get to a state where I could check the balancing on some of the later levels. That right there really shows the importance of having good tools. Meaning don't just build your game, but actually build tools to help you build your game. So in this example, this is part of the reason why I actually tend to make like save systems relatively early on in the process, because then I can make a save file at a certain point. And then if I want to iterate upon some mechanics up at that point, it is very easy to just reload the save file and there's no need to waste these 20 minutes trying to get to that point. So remember that you're not just making a game, but you can also make tools to help you build your game. I was listening to this really good podcast called Designer Notes where I think they were interviewing the developers of Armello on how they set up a core gameplay loop that they could test anything and within five minutes know if it was a fun feature to add to the game. Now, if I wind up making another roguelike game, what I'm probably going to do is keep the entire gameplay loop to under 20 minutes, make it quick, snappy, and fun. I don't have to reinvent the wheel. I don't have to make a grand 4X strategy game. I want to make something that I can complete. And that, I think, is a much more realistic goal. The important thing underlying all of this is the power of iteration. Basically, whenever you come up with your original design, whenever you write down whatever game design document you have, whenever you do that, chances are that it's not going to be perfect. It is not going to work perfect the same way. It is not going to work perfect the first time. So in order to make a proper game, you have to constantly play it. You have to constantly iterate upon it. Iteration really is the main force that helps you make a great game. So you have either build tools to help you iterate various parts of your game easily, or like you were saying, Make a game focused on a smaller gameplay time, like a roguelike, you can do 20 minute runs and people love that. So doing that, you can easily constantly play, constantly iterate upon it, find out what works, what doesn't, and constantly build upon it. The next point on architecture, uh, that's something that I actually feel like I did correctly. I talked about it in my Godot video, but that book on game programming patterns was huge. I feel like I really spent a lot of time the first few months setting up a rock solid architecture. So now whenever I want to add a new card or add a new relic, it's super easy. Everything flows very well. I didn't have to refactor the project at all. Very, very happy with how the architecture turned out. So I wanted to add one little win that I had. That's awesome. That is really cool. It really shows you how you focus on writing good proper code, meaning don't just write things quick and dirty. Make something really nice and solid. And even as your game reaches the end stage, it is still relatively easy to keep adding things onto it. Whereas if you make it constantly quick and dirty with tons of hacks, tons of nasty code, if you do that, then by the end of the development, it is going to become a huge mess trying to add more things. I'm speaking that from experience. My first two games, Survivor Squad and Survivor Squad Gauntlets, I remember at the end of the development of those, it was really tricky to add new mechanics. It was really frustrating, very difficult. So you have definitely having a rock solid core architecture that you can build upon it. That is going to be so, so useful. So definitely do focus on that, especially on these kinds of games, more systems heavy, code heavy games. On these, if you don't have a good architecture, you are going to suffer a lot. But if you do do it right, then it becomes a breeze to work with. It makes all the other things like iteration, game design, gameplay loop, all of that becomes much, much easier because you know your architecture is solid and you can easily build upon it and iterate upon it. Moving on to intuitiveness and having actual players 
play test the game. Back in January, I set up a play test. If you're selling on Steam, you get a free play test uh, app ID that you can give out keys to everybody. It's not for the final game, it's just for a play test. But this was awesome as I got players to actually check out the game and tell me what made sense and what didn't. This led to a lot of really important changes and I was able to refocus more on mechanics that players really enjoyed and spent less time building out mechanics that no one really cared about. It also came down to the little things such as player asking me, you know, how do I do X? And I say, you click button Y. They say, oh, I didn't know that. And I'm like, oh, well, yeah, I never told them to click button Y. Yeah, that's another thing that is really common. As a developer, as you are building your game for literally months on end, you can really become blinded to some things that seem really super easy, super obvious, but they're only obvious to you as the developer because you built it. So a new player coming in, they have no idea on the mechanics, what all the buttons do. So when it comes to tutorials, you definitely have to teach your players how to play the game properly. Making a good tutorial, that is another very important, very difficult skill, but it is definitely a very valuable skill. If a player gets frustrated and doesn't know how you play your game, then that really sucks. It sucks for you, it sucks for the player, it sucks for everyone. So make sure all your controls, all your systems, all of that is very intuitive so that a brand new player can actually figure out how to play your game. And yep, another great tip, the power of testing. Definitely make sure you don't not test your game. So do test your game as often and as much as possible. Get family, friends, anyone you know, get them to play test the game. He was talking about the scene play test feature. That is a really awesome one if you want to get a bunch of people play testing your game. Getting feedback from the actual players is one of the best ways to improve upon your game. I'm going to briefly touch on marketing. Twitter was kind of mid. I don't feel like I got a whole lot out of the amount of time I put into that, but maybe that's just because I have a younger account. YouTube videos take a lot, a lot of time and effort, and I'd rather be spending more of that time and effort on developing games. So sub count has definitely been dropping, but that's okay. Yeah, when it comes to marketing, that is always a tricky thing. There is really no guaranteed way to win. So the best way to do marketing is really just post as much as you can, as often as you can on as many platforms as possible. Just post all kinds of things and hope that something sticks. Now, like I said there, I can definitely understand the feeling of, okay, I really rather not do marketing and just focusing on working on the game. But always keep in mind that if you do that, if you don't focus on marketing at all, then even if you make an awesome game, nobody's going to hear about it. So even though marketing usually sucks, usually takes time away from actually building the game, if so, it is still a very important thing, especially if you're trying to make games, trying to find success with your games. If you're making it as a hobby, just for fun, just play with friends and don't worry about this at all. But if you're trying to get some level of success, then yeah, marketing is something you absolutely need to do. It will take time away from the game, but really just think about the alternative. If you don't do marketing, then even if you make a great game, nobody's going to hear about it. So work in the game, make the best game possible, but then also make sure that people know the game exists. Also, um, getting into Steam Fests, you'll hear a lot about how important it is. It is not a guarantee. I got denied from the Deck Builder Fest. I got denied from the uh, Endless Replayability Fest. I did finally get into the Tower Defense Fest. Yeah, when it comes to Steam Festivals, there are basically two different types. There is Steam Next Fest, which happens twice a year. Those you can join with any game. There's really no approval process. You can just join and you won't be accepted. But you can only participate on a single one of those. So usually the recommended advice is make sure you participate on one just before a game releases. And the second type, the second type is what he was mentioning. It's those Steam Fests. Those happen every once in a while, and those do indeed require some kind of approval. So Steam basically defines the theme for that festival. Then you can sign up with your game to participate in that festival, and they will see, does this match the theme or not? If so, they accept it. If not, they don't. Those themed festivals, those usually don't have any limits, so participate in as many as you can. And for the Steam Next Fest, also make sure you participate in that one. And I said the list was seven. I lied. It's now eight. Little bonus tip, don't skip out on life. I was able to try to go to the gym every day and keep up relationships, but... My health definitely suffered. I uh, didn't get out of the house very often, wasn't walking around much. Yeah, also a very important tip. I have to say, personally, this is definitely one tip that I'm constantly struggling with, but I do try to work on it. So yeah, do not spend six months just stuck in your room, just working on your game. Make sure you balance out things a little bit. For me, my two big things is the gym and walking my dogs. That is something that I do not sacrifice for any reason. So every day I've got some breaks that I do regardless of what I'm working on. That coupled with also never sacrificing sleep, I think those three things are what really helps me. It's what has really kept me safe from burnout, even though I work, I would say, usually way too much. Now, I'm really glad I stuck to it. The final game's not perfect, but I'm very, very happy with everything that I've accomplished. The pinnacle achievement, I think, of working on this game for six months is this video and taking everything that I learned and applying it to the next game, which is just gonna be two times as good as this one. Thank you for watching. If any of this has helped you at all, please consider dropping a like. It makes a huge difference in the algorithm. And if you wanna see what this game becomes, and what my next game is, feel free to subscribe and stick around. Thank you guys. 
Yeah, really awesome video, lots of really great tips. Go ahead and give the video a like and subscribe. Also go check out the game on Steam, which is out right now. All in all, 8 really awesome tips. Alright, I hope you found my thoughts helpful. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time.